Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We like to explore why we do what we do with researchers, authors, and practitioners in a conversational setting in order to bring those insights to people who want to apply them to their work and life. People like you. And in this episode, Tim, we are bringing some great insights on how to make your personal life just a little bit more fulfilling through an app on your mobile phone. Yes, yes, I said an app (laughs) on your mobile phone. (laughs) Yeah. To do so, we spoke with Beck Weeks, the founder of the new app called Peak. Okay, so for those of you who are just listening and not reading, the Peak app is spelled P-I-Q-U-E. So its definition is really more about stimulating curiosity and interest and not so much about just the pinnacle of something. Okay, but that aside, Peak is an app designed by some of the brightest minds in behavioral science, including Beck and her partners, Sindel Mullianathan and Mike Norton. And just to highlight one of those, if you're not familiar with Sendel's work, he is a professor at the Booth School at the University of Chicago, and we encourage you to check out his book, Scarcity. If you want a thrilling read on applying behavioral science to policy development, truly, it's a great book. Together, Beck, Mike, and Sendel have been exploring how machine learning can be combined with personal data to help individuals become wiser. That's something that you need, Tim. <laughs> Man, I need it every day. <laughs> I, that's, that's definitely the case. But the Peak app is a great way to improve the quality of your day-to-day life, and we hope you check it out in the app store of your favorite mobile device. And... If you've got a challenging issue at your work that you'd like to solve through a behavioral science lens, reach out to Kurt or me. We would love to connect. We would. And we are available at this point, at least uh, right now, right now for a little bit. Uh, There we go. We might not be available in a week, (laughs) but right now, right now we are available, but not for long. All right. So with that, folks, please, we hope that you can sit back with a fine pour of curiosity and enjoy our conversation with Beck Weeks. Beck Weeks, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you. It's so lovely to be here with you both. Oh, we are excited to have you here. And as always, we start with a speed round. So I get to start. So would you rather live by the beach or live in the mountains? Oh, I'm a Sydney girl, so it's beaches all the way. Mm. Good answer. Just good answer there. (laughs) Passed that one. There you go. (laughs) Three more to go. (laughs) Coffee or tea? At home, tea. If I'm out, coffee. So what's the difference? Why is it out being coffee? Well, and I'll hark back to my Australian roots a little bit too, where we're very particular about coffee. We love particularly, we're really into espresso-based beverages. So I love a flat white, um, which I can't really make at home. So I, at home, I'll have a cup of English breakfast tea, Lady Grey tea. I love tea. We also, Australians, we love our tea being, you know, from the, the Brits, but out, I love a coffee. Wow, that's so interesting. I I, I kind of get that. I, I I tend to find myself focusing on ordering uh, dinners out. You know, back in the days when we used to be able to go out, making sure that I was ordering something that I wouldn't easily make at home. You know, that this wouldn't yes. be a normal thing that I would make at home. I wanted to do a kind of experiment and explore. Okay, that's not about me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> As Tim longs on and on about his time when we're eating out. All right. Would you prefer to live a year without your mobile phone or without your laptop? Oh, um, I think I could go, well, that's such a tough one. I'm going to say without the laptop because I think I just don't know if I could be out in the world. I, I've forgotten how to navigate anywhere without <laughs> maps. I, I, I think I, I could probably also sneak by with most things on the phone. So I, I, I do, I'm one of those people who I, I'm, Although I know it's good advice, I often can't really go for a walk without the phone. So I, I'm going to have to say I'd have to live without the laptop. Interesting. You know, Danny Oppenheimer at uh, Carnegie Mellon actually went a year without a mobile phone. He and his wife went to London on a first sabbatical and they gave up their mobile phones and he said life was great. So 
I, I admire that. And I probably, you know, maybe I could give it a shot. Maybe you just start out small. Maybe for a week I could try it and see if I could get by. <laughs> for a day, for an hour. Yeah, for an yeah. hour. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, last speed round question. Can a three-minute adventure on Peak change the way you look at the world? We hope so. Yeah. Really hope so. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what is Peak? Because at least some of our listeners who aren't familiar, probably everybody is, but there might be a few. Who aren't. So tell us a little bit about Peak. Yeah. So I think the main idea behind Peak is that there are so many insights from psychology, from behavioral science that can help you change the way you see the world, the way you approach the world, the way you live your life. And a lot of those great insights are captured in these, you know, great academic papers or really engaging books by those academics who they want to help those ideas reach an audience. And they've, I think they've done an amazing job of making those insights more accessible in those books, but reading can only take you so far. And so to really learn and internalize those ideas, you know, we have to do things. So that's where Peak comes in, that we really, we help you do those things. We like to say we help you do the book. So we work <laughs> with these fabulous academic authors to transform the ideas and the concepts from their books into experiences for our users in the app. And we call these experiences um, moments. So each moment, um, this, that's these little three minute adventures, each moment conveys an idea or a concept and we present it in what we hope is an interesting and engaging way. And then we offer an opportunity to practice using that insight right there and then. So I'll give you an example um, that probably harks back to something we actually just talked about and, and I'll you'll laugh at me a little bit for this, but I'm going to start with a really tactical example from Ashley Willen's book, Time Smart. And so we worked with Ashley, we built this moment around this concept of, of airplane mode. So let me talk about what we mean. So in this moment, we, we paint a picture for the user. You know, imagine that you're sitting, watching a movie and your phone pings, you're distracted, you pick it up, it happens a few more times. Suddenly you're totally lost, you've got no idea what's going on in the movie. You know, hopefully it's a scenario that the user can relate to and that they could imagine that they've felt that kind of thing in their own lives. We then step through some of the related science, including this lovely concept of time confetti, this idea that these interruptions fragment blocks of time into these small chunks of time confetti so that even if we do have, say, a break from work for an hour, it doesn't really feel like we've had a full hour break because it's been broken up into all these chunks of time confetti. So we've painted this picture, we've now outlined some of the science and made a case for why these kind of interruptions could be harmful. And now it's time to do something about it. So we're going to ask our users to do exactly what we just talked about, which was try to commit to going to some uh, amount of tech free time. And exactly as you just suggested, we suggest starting really small, you know, 30 minutes, they can pick the amount of time that they want to try. We ask them to decide how they'll ensure they're going to go tech free. So, you know, maybe they'll commit to putting their phone in, in the kitchen drawer or give it to their housemate or something. And then that that detail and the time block goes into their calendar so they have everything they need to have the tech free time when that reminder pops up. Now that's a it's a super, super simple and that's a particularly tactical example, but I hope that illustrates the kind of thing that we're trying to do with Peak. Yeah, it's fascinating. So I love the concept of do the book, right? Not just read the book and hope that you are going to be changed by it, but actually take the insights from that book and make them applicable so that people are actually doing some of the things that they're being taught to do in this book so that it actually becomes uh, more of a habit, more of a practice. And, I, and you're working with some really cool authors. So tell us a little bit about some of the authors that you have in. And I was just thinking of when I said that, of a Wendy Wood. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, Absolutely. And yes, funny you should mention Wendy. So we're, we're working right now with Wendy on transforming her book, Good Habits, Bad Habits, um, into the content for Peak. We've just released this week content that we developed with Dolly Chug and her book, The Person You Mean to Be, How Good People Fight Bias, which we're really excited about. Um, we're also working at the moment with Katie Milkman on her upcoming book, How to Change, which is coming out in May, working with Annie Duke on her book, How to Decide, and working with Lydie Klotz on his book, Subtract, which is all about the power of subtracting and why we overlook it as a solution to various problems or situations in our life. So lots more to come as well. And of course, I should say working with my co-founders, Sendhil Mulanathan, um, on his book that he co-authored with uh, Eldar Shafir, Scarcity, 
and with my other co-founder, Mike Norton, on the book he co-authored with Elizabeth Dunn, Happy Money. So lots to come, lots in the pipeline right now that we're really excited about and uh, can't wait to get it out there. Oh, that is not going to suck. Let's just, let's just say that is fantastic content. Like these are some of our favorite books, period. So so that's going to be fantastic. Well, tell us about uh, tell us a little bit about the organizational structure. How does someone get into Peak, and then how do they navigate through it? Great question. So I I won't give too much away, but there's quite a nice little onboarding experience that hopefully conveys a little bit about the ethos of of the app. And uh, currently, the way the app is structured, you'll come into the app having asked been asked a few questions that help us recommend some of the the different. Um, activities and moments that are in the app for you. And the idea then is we want you to uh, select things that you'd like to try and sort of commit to trying a particular book or a particular other sort of set of moments that you can then work through. And it's up to you though, if you'd like to, if you'd like to work through all of the, the moments from Time Smart, that's great. If you'd like to intersperse between some of the Time Smart moments, some of the the person you mean to be moments, that's great too. We also we propose moment of the day on the home screen if you'd like to be surprised by something that we'd like to suggest for you. So this is something that we're also continuing to evolve. So we're going to be thinking a lot more as we have more and more content in the app as well about the best ways to structure it. And so hopefully your listeners will see that continuing to evolve too over the coming months. So when you're working with an author on their book or their paper, what's the process? How do you take what is written down in a book and decide what are those moments that you're going to make into you know part of the app that they actually do things? How does that work? We typically start by thinking about what are the things that will be really surprising and interesting and impactful in someone's daily life? So we're usually trying to make sure that that moment experience has all of those elements. It has a practical element that they can, there's some sort of activity that we can design that they are able to try and live that principle. And sometimes that activity is something tactical like I outlined with Ashley's moment But it could also be something that's more reflective if we're trying to get people to think differently Mm. about something. So that would also constitute an activity. And then as we think about how we construct what we like to think of as a a small narrative arc to get into that idea, we're typically trying to ideally situate someone in a context they can understand or maybe do something surprising with a bit of a twist. You know, ideally we want people, we want people to be really engaged by the time they get to the activity and be brought into the idea that this is important. And so we'll work with the author to make sure that as we're coming up with the ideas for what those arcs will look like, that they believe also that that we've done a successful job of translating what they intended to get across for the user in our app. You know, for all the seriousness that goes into the content, uh, there's quite a bit of cheekiness in the app itself. (laughs) Uh, You know, you, you have things like, you know, you don't have a strategy for peeing. Or, yeah. <laughs> or or asking people, uh, did we just scare you? You know, why why yeah. aren't you coming back? Uh, <laughs> tell me about the role of humor in in Peak. It is central, and I'm so glad that you you noticed it and brought it up. It's definitely something that we think is super important to what we're trying to do. I think part of it is certainly us as a founding team. We all share the view that just because we're working on things that might be serious or important, that doesn't mean they can't be fun. And in fact, I think a lot of the science shows us that when people are having fun, they're more likely to retain information, stay engaged. So our view is humor should be front and central. Uh, And in fact, I I should mention that actually one of the books we're working on right now is Humor Seriously by uh, two uh, Stanford, uh, Stanford professor and a Stanford lecturer and Jennifer Aker and, and Naomi Magdonis, and they are fantastic and, and I think really bringing that idea of the importance of humour to, to life. And that's something that we feel so passionately about with Peak, and that's why there is that cheekiness throughout. And so we work with, you know, some of the people on our team are humour writers, uh, people out of Second City here in Chicago. That's something that we really want to make sure is really infused throughout all of the content so that we think that that is also something that differentiates us, certainly from academic papers, which aren't necessarily known for being particularly humorous. <laughs> I think maybe you'll sort of slip in a, a humorous title every now and then, but usually that's yeah. about as far as it goes. <laughs> yeah, that's um, about as far as it goes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if at all, yeah. If at all. So we're definitely bringing that to to bear. And often we, we talk to about this idea of 
we want to sort of peak it up. If it, if it feels a little flat or dry or oh, sort of too, something you've seen elsewhere or a bit too expected, that's not yet something that's quite ready for peak. We need to kind of peak it up a bit. And that's definitely something that we make sure we do. No, oh, I love that concept. And I, I agree full heartedly that the <laughs> element of humor, bringing people in and having some fun is can only be a positive as, as we're going through this. Obviously, though, you guys are behavioral scientists. You have some really good credentials behind you. And I'm sure as you're looking to create these things, you're also looking at how do we measure this and various different aspects of it. So how do you bring that in? How do you bring in the, the rigor? Uh, obviously, Tim talked about the humor, but there's also the rigor of making sure that these actually, these moments are impacting people and that they're working. What do you guys bring? How do you bring that in? Mm, great question. So I think I'd say a couple of things. One is we make sure that we, I mentioned that we ask users to reflect and sometimes that's that's actually something that happens after the activity. So there may be a subsequent reflection piece for the user so they can think for themselves, you know, did this work for me? Did that, was this helpful? And we collect that information from users when they're able to say how they experienced the moment. Part of what we want to encourage people there as well is that, you know, just we've created these moments believing that in general, they hopefully will have an impact. But we know that that averages don't mean that things will have an impact for everyone. And so in some ways, what we want to do is almost encourage an experimental mindset and make failure feel okay. So make it such that if you tried that moment and that one didn't work out, that's totally fine. That's great. You learn something about yourself and about the fact that that thing didn't work for you. And that doesn't mean that peak isn't for you. There's tons of different moments in there. And so trying something else and having that experimental mindset to say, let me keep exploring is something we really want to encourage for people. And then over time, as we have more and more users on the platform, I think that we'll, we'll hope to start to do more sort of self-assessment um, on a few different scales, but that's probably a little bit further down the track for us. But we intend to do things like measuring um, self-reported well-being and those kinds of outcome measures. That sounds fantastic. So uh, how does the word peak, and maybe you could define it for our listeners as well, how did, how did you come to the word peak as the name for the app? And, and maybe we should spell it because as we're, as yes. we're just saying it, people <laughs> might be thinking it is a mountaintop. Uh, <laughs> or a look around the corner. But or a look around the corner, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it could it's be maybe peak, all of those yeah. things, but that's not how it's spelled. So. That's right. It's not. It's peak with a Q. So it's P I Q U E, um, and and it's it's very much not sort of mountaintop peak. You know, this is not an an app about necessarily sort of reaching your greatest potential. In fact, we kind of we like to take a slightly you know, look. Every app does its own thing, but we're that's not really what we're about. We're about growing and learning and exploring, and it's less about the ultimate self optimization of of an individual um, for themselves. So for us, it's about let's help you pique your curiosity in the world around you, pique your interest in new things. Uh, we did, I have very fond memories of a couple of days that we actually spent together as a team coming up with peak. And there were lots of very bad ideas that got tossed around <laughs> and left on the cutting room floor. <laughs> any, you care um, to share with us? Any, any really bad ideas? Oh that gosh. Um, I all I remember is that there was one that we we couldn't even really agree as a team on how you would pronounce it, and then we said, "Well, that's it. We can't we can't do that." <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> but there were lots that. I, what was really amazing, actually, was just how many of the words had very different associations. So I think one that came up, which actually I've seen now, is a, I think it's a a news audio app called Curio. So we're, because we are very focused on curiosity, this was one that came mm -hmm. up. And for some people, it had this notion of clutter and a sort of a cabinet of curios, whereas I'd never heard that expression before. Oh. And so both amongst our team, you know, we talked about these different things and then we did actually run a, a small little survey just to see if there were any associations with the words that we were thinking about that we hadn't caught on to before we picked one. And Peak got through that test. So uh, Peak it is. <laughs> well, you did a much better job than Tim and I did with picking behavioral grooves out because we just, <laughs> we, we, we found it, we liked it, and then we realized we had two very different interpretations of it at the end. So Wildly different. It was all crazy, but that's another story. So just... Yes, it is. So, you know, don't care to share it here? I, I, I'd love to. We've shared it many times on the program. I think our listeners are, are sick. But, 
to yeah. death of listening to that. But that's the risk of, you know, for us, that was the risk of hearing the words and thinking that's perfect and agreeing on that moving forward. And then only a week or some later discovering, wait a minute, we have totally different ideas. Like it, it's actually worth being a little more conscious, a little more intentional, a little more thoughtful, have a conversation about what the damn words mean. I think that's really the, that's Absolutely. our takeaway. Yeah. I will share one, one little tidbit, which was uh, before we came up with Peak, we had to pick a name for the company. And so we actually, we just, this this concept that we'd been talking about a lot, which it wasn't a sort of late stage runner for the name of of the app, but in the end we decided it was a bit too complicated. But it, this concept of jamais vu, which I don't know if that's familiar, but you've probably heard of the term deja vu, mm -hmm. which is the sense of, the sense that you've seen something before. And jamais vu literally in French translates to never seen. And it's this sense of seeing something as if with new eyes, um, as if for the first time. And so that is something that we really felt was so, a core part of the, the ethos that we had as well, which is let's help people see things in ways they haven't seen the world before. Um, sometimes we talk about it almost sort of seeing as if through the eyes of a child. So that was one that I think the, the feedback on that name from one of these surveys that we did was that everybody thought it was an app to learn French. So we we thought that's not going to be particularly helpful. Wee <laughs> wee. Oui, oui. All right. There we go. <laughs> I'm curious if we could kind of take that and go back a little bit in your personal history, because if I understand correctly, that some of your your work at Harvard was focused on algorithm and uh, algorithmic techniques and advanced analytical techniques. First of all, is that correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. And I was primarily focused on. It was actually a project I was working on with Sendel at the time. Uh, in those six months at Harvard, we were working on applying. Uh, analytics and algorithmic techniques in building an app that could analyze your email data and help you identify whether you were exhibiting any gender bias in the way that you differentially responded to men versus women. And so some of the things we were looking at were super basic, simple pieces of analytics, such as, you know, time to respond and do you respond differentially to men versus to women? Some of the other things were a bit more complicated. So using some natural language processing algorithms to say, do you use more words of of power or deference differentially with men versus women and this all went into a, an app that we were building a beta of just to see if there was something there that we were calling knowing me um, and we did a small pilot with ideas 42 just to test whether there was anything there and and that was that was sort of the start actually that was pre-peak but thinking about how could we apply some of what we know in the behavioral world into more sort of everyday applications. And we were particularly interested too in this concept of, of data and the data that we have on ourselves. How could we, you know, companies around us, Googles and the Facebooks and of the world, they use our data all the time, but how could we actually tap into our data and use that to better understand ourselves? So that was also this, this starting to, to move towards thinking about how can we better understand ourselves and what are the ways we can continue to do that um, more thoroughly? Yeah. So the germination of the concept of peak was actually started well before you you actually started working on peak and this understanding of hey let's get to know ourselves a little better and apply some of these principles to it yes exactly and that was it was while i was there for those 6 months at harvard that that sendel and had connected me to mike norton and so that was that was when around that time we started to to meet and think well what else could we be thinking about and and that was sort of the germination of peak around you know from that point onwards did you not know how much damn work is involved in building an app, though? I mean, it, it's a lot of work. Uh, so you, you had to have a tremendous amount of motivation to go forward. What, what's part of your why, I guess, is sort of the underlying question. I think for me, it was the excitement of building something and maybe starting to work on on this Knowing Me project that I had been working on in the previous six months with Sendel had started to scratch an itch of... I'd love to see something that I built, helped to build, be out there. And that was something that I hadn't really done previously in my career. My career prior to that was focused on, you know, I, I was working in behavioral science research in Australia's nudge unit. And prior to that, I was working in management consulting, which is all about helping other people do things. But it's primarily, even as, as much as consulting firms will say, we get results, not reports. It's to some extent, you're still, 
you're writing reports and, and doing analysis and helping set up teams so that then they can go and do things. And this felt like the first opportunity to be part of a team and that would build something together that we would then put out into the world. And that was really, really exciting to build something from from nothing too, which is something I'd never been I'd never done before. Did you see yourself as an entrepreneur? Oh, that's a great question. I I don't think I did. And I, I think that was sort of part of how why I ended up sort of falling falling backwards into it in some ways. I don't know that I I wasn't one of those people who said, I'm desperate to be an entrepreneur, so let me find an idea that I feel, you know, excited enough about to take forward. It was more, wow, this this idea that we've come across almost naturally together that we've sort of started noodling on naturally together is so exciting that I can't not work on it. Um, and so I think it was more, okay, well, that's, well, I'm going to have to do it. Can I, can I find it within myself to, to be an entrepreneur? And, you know, I think at that point I have an MBA, so I've, I'd had some exposure to some of the, the toolkit and I'd, I'd worked in consulting. So you've seen other pieces of it there, but there's definitely, there are a whole lot of other skills that you really only learn on the job as well. And I think that was probably another exciting aspect of it too, which is, well, I'm going to learn a ton. Even if even if this doesn't work, I will have learned just an incredible amount of, of stuff and that will have been an amazing experience. And so I think that in the end overcame any fear of failure and just the desire to sort of throw myself into it. Um, but yes, there were, it wasn't without sort of moments of fear. Um, and I think probably partly also just feeling like, well, I've got Mike Norton, Sendall, Molinarvan in this with me as well. You know, we've got an amazing team to sort of bound together to to make this try to try to make this work. And so that felt like, well, I, how could I possibly not do this? This is a <laughs> dream team to be a part of. So that was probably my thinking at the time. Yeah, it does sound like a dream team, and it sounds like you've been inspired by the idea. So what has been the biggest challenge in this journey so far? If you didn't start off to be an entrepreneur, but that you were mesmerized by this concept and the team that you get to work with, there's obviously been some challenges that you've probably faced. What was the, what one stands out for you? Oh gosh, I think the, the feeling that everything is on you to some extent. Mm -hmm. So when I think back, for instance, to my time in management consulting, you don't need to think about anything outside of the particular project that you're working on, that one case that you're trying to crack. And compare that to today, you know, any given day, I'm thinking about what is our vision for peak in five years? What's our strategy? What is our go-to-market strategy? Who is Who are the next authors that we're working with? How are we going to think about um, how to, what we're going to build out next on the on the platform, as well as questions like, which payroll software should I use? <laughs> How, what is payroll? <laughs> How do do I need to get a bookkeeper? Could I be a bookkeeper? What's what's accounting software? You know, just I guess when I think back to 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 the MBA, I mean, there are so many tactical, practical questions that we never covered, even in all of the talk about all of the various entrepreneurial courses that I did. You don't really cover those kinds of things. Things like how will I recruit people for this business? Where will I find people who want to work on a tiny startup? All of those things, I think that the fact that the day can be everything. And so I think one of the challenges then is, is both switching constantly between all those things. And I find that that can, you know, I have to try to work to create some segments of the day where I feel like I really do get enough time to start to move into some deep work where that's needed and think carefully about you know, some of Sendel's work, for instance, around thinking about your bandwidth, not just your calendar. I'm really trying more and more to to think carefully about not just, well, I've got a half an hour, I can slot this in there, but will I actually have the mental capacity at that point to think about what I need to think about at that time? And then I think just the, it can be a bit isolating, I think, as an entrepreneur. And especially, as I mentioned, I'm lucky to, have, to be working with Sendel and Mike, but they've got full-time jobs at universities, you know, they're full-time academic professors. So they're not involved day to day, every day. Um, and I'm really lucky that I do, I work with a wonderful developer who is around day to day, but even prior to the pandemic, he's remote in Massachusetts, I'm in Chicago. And so you're by yourself a little bit, I guess. And that was 
lessened slightly by the fact that we worked out of a, a co-working space. We were part of an incubator program connected to the University of Chicago for a while, which was wonderful to have people around because I've definitely realized, I, I think I knew before, but I'm a people person. I need people <laughs> around. So it was already, I, I'd solved that slightly to some extent before the pandemic. Pandemic makes that a little bit harder. We're all just alone in our houses now working, but Yes, sometimes I think the isolation. So I think if you're an entrepreneur who is isolated, doing whatever you can to lessen that, whether it's working in a co-working space, being a part of an incubator, or even just having other people that you talk to regularly. This is a bit of a side tangent, but I've actually developed a little accountability group mm -hmm. with three of us who are all doing very self-directed work. And we, we meet up on Zoom every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. And we look back on how the goals that we set last week, you know, did we achieve them? And because we're all little nerds motivated by external rewards, we give ourselves grades in a spreadsheet <laughs> and we talk about our goals for the next week and we sort of admit to each other if there were things where we slipped up or if there are emails Loki in our inbox that we haven't written back to and we kind of help each other get past those. So I think that sort of thing has really helped overcome some of the, the lonelier moments that entrepreneurship can create. Yeah, I was going to follow up with, obviously, that you just talked about a bunch of the challenges, but then I'm assuming that there might have been a couple of pleasant surprises uh, that you <laughs> had not anticipated in thinking through, oh, we're going to start this company. And, and if you had any insight on maybe a pleasant surprise, and it sounds like maybe this accountability group is one of those pleasant surprises, but are there others? Definitely. For me in particular, I guess on the content side, just being able to work with all of these amazing authors, I think I probably didn't anticipate that when I started. And so that's led to so many wonderful, you know, brainstorming calls. I, I'm really someone who thinks out loud. And so being able to talk and throw those ideas around with people has been really, really just such a thrill. I think probably also just being able to to make the decisions to craft the thing in the way that you want. And of course that comes with with the downside of, yes, sometimes you could get yourself into a little bit of analysis, decision paralysis where you're not sure how you, you're meant to make a decision. But I think that one thing that entrepreneurship does teach you is it's just all about decisions in the face of uncertainty and getting comfortable with coming up with a way to make them and then just making them and feeling good that you made a good decision, which is a lot of, by the way, what we, what Annie Duke's book, How to Decide, that's going to be in the app soon, is going to be covering. So if you're, if you're someone out there who's thinking a lot about decision making and how to feel that you made a good decision, that's something you should look forward to. So that has been something I think really, it's been very empowering to feel that I get to make those kinds of decisions, even though it can also be a little bit daunting at times. But I've, it does mean too that when, I, I feel very proud of what we as a team put out there. And that's been a real thrill to see something that we feel proud of going out. So it's clear that you have an overabundance of passion around this. But what was your gateway drug? What got you interested in behavioral science to start with? Oh, I I remember when I went to business school, a friend actually gave me a copy of Thinking Fast and Slow. That was my introduction into the the field really at all. And while I was at business school, I started taking some courses more formally in the subject. So I took Bridget Madrian's course on uh, behavioral science in public policy. So that was probably my first sense that sense of what this field was and what it could do. And then I think looking back, I probably realized that I'd been doing a little bit of behavioral science type thinking in some of the customer work that I'd done previously in consulting. And more and more, I think just being fascinated by why do we think the way that we do? Why do we make these kinds of, of errors as well? I, I think it really, for me, my undergrad degree, I, I did degrees in law and economics in undergrad. And so for me, it was, you know, I, uh, economics was super interesting, but I think I always had that slight skepticism about the rationality model. And, and I, th I loved that old joke about the You've got the economist, the mathematician, and the physicist who are trying to work out how to open a can of beans on a desert island. And, you know, the mathematician and the physicist each have various answers about how they'll do it. And the economist's answer is, I don't understand the problem. Why don't we just assume we have a can opener? And so <laughs> those kinds of that aspect of economics, I think, had always yeah made me giggle slash slightly skeptical. And I think for me, behavioral economics then made me really excited to think about, wow, this is a field that's actually thinking about 
why we think the way we do, why we act the way we act and isn't just sort of making these assumptions that don't bear up in the real world. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for for sharing that. Uh, I was wondering, just riffing on the Desert Island joke here, what top three artists would you take with you if you had to spend the rest of your life on a desert island? Oh my musical gosh. artist. Is this this is a musical, musical artist? artist. This is We're into the groove session. It's not not a uh, <laughs> Not a Van Gogh or a, a Monet. <laughs> we're, we're talking I, mean, music. I, I can imagine contemplating Starry Night for the rest of my life, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is such a good question. And I might have to finagle a slightly sneaky answer because I think I am one of those people who I don't know that I have favorite artists. I probably have favorite playlists, I think. Okay. Except I, I will say that my favorite artist that. I had to laugh. I was listening to your episode with with Logan Yuri, and my she mentioned that her artist of the decade or album of the decade, I think, was the Hamilton soundtrack. So it was yeah. mine. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, and but I, I don't know. Like her, I think I've sort of stopped listening to it as much now. So I may not take that to my desert island. Let's see. I, I'm not sure if I have a great answer for a particular artists. I'm famous in, amongst my friends for being five, ten years late to an artist. I think it was or more about five years ago i think i said to my friends "Ooh, radiohead what a cool sound <laughs> <laughs> um so i i definitely i have some friends who are super passionate about certain artists and i and they'll insist on only putting on for instance that album and listening to the album all the way through i'm much more of a i want music for my mood so let me put on a you know dance dancey playlist or a sing in the shower playlist or that kind of thing all right. So what three playlists, if you had to only have three playlists, is it the dancing in the shower playlist? Is it the, <laughs> yes. the you know? <laughs> so I will definitely, I will take a, I will take a sing in the shower playlist, which will have a mix of some sort of popular stuff. There'll be some Taylor Swift, some Dua Lipa, some musical songs from, you know, Wicked and Frozen and Moana. <laughs> so I'll definitely take one of those. I'll take a sort of relaxed Sunday vibes type playlist where I, I love to just have some music on while I'm doing things around the house and that sort of gentle but kind of slightly groovy music, I think. And then I probably would take, let's see, I'd probably have to then take an exercise playlist that had slightly more sort of upbeat, things I could run to, things I could, uh, things I probably discovered via my Peloton instructor. So that's <laughs> that's become one of my big music discovery um, places lately. So wow. that's what I yeah, that's what I do. We're gonna have to just assume that the island has a shower. We're just we're just yeah. gonna start there. Yeah, we're just <laughs> we'll play the economist uh, card on that. So do you listen to music while you work? If you've got this spe specific vibe for Saturday for Sunday morning, do you listen while you work? Sometimes. I think if I'm if I'm really trying to focus, I'll I'll put on a, a playlist that has some sort of mostly instrumental or very little lyrics. And I usually I use Spotify to find, you know, there's a couple of people I follow and they have good playlists for that sort of thing. So I'll typically pick those. But I actually often find that, particularly if I'm trying to do deeper thinking pretty quickly, it, it helps me sort of settle in and settle down, but fairly quickly, I almost want to turn it off and I'm finding myself a little bit distracted. So then I, I sort of use it to get into it, but then I'll, I'll switch it off. But if I'm doing things that I, I need a bit more help focusing because it's a little more maybe mundane, or I've just kind of got to crank through some things, then I will, I will listen to music. And I actually, I think my most listened to song last year was this one song I used to put on when I would do a bit of coding and I would just have it on loop so that I wouldn't get distracted <laughs> by, by a new song starting. Um, it was a Billie Eilish song and it was my most listened to song of the last year. <laughs> but uh, yeah, back in, back in consulting, when I was doing a lot of you know analysis in Excel, we used to put on quite sort of upbeat, um, a lot of girl talk. They do a lot of sampling of things. It was quite fun music. We would do these sort of synchronized listening sessions where everybody would say, okay, we're going to start the playlist now. And uh, people would sort of be on the chat saying, oh, I love this part. And that was sort of a fun a way to make the midnight Excel analysis kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. You don't have any big Australian bands or, or artists that you're following, not a 
I do love, you know, Tame Impala is an mm-hmm. Aussie band that I would definitely represent. And I, I don't know if you guys, well, I don't know if your Spotify users and if you've run, I've seen this little tool that's out there where it'll assess your Spotify and uh, and sort of insult you based on your Spotify Spotify playlist. It told me, oh, great, another Tame Impala stan. Um, so obviously a lot of people out there are <laughs> Tame, Tame there, Impala stans. It's good music. What, what the, it's you know, great. what's, yeah, what's wrong with, with Tame Impala? I just, yeah. We've, we've well, if, you're the, like, if you're the Spotify algorithm or whatever it was that is doing that, they're they're finding some some issue yeah. with that, obviously. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> but I like to I've got some classic old school Aussie bands as well, like Powderfinger and the Whitlams and Spider Bait, Cat Empire yeah. was a great one that I've seen in concert yeah. a few times. Oh, so yeah. yeah, I definitely I have actually I I can't, they'll, they'll kill me back home. I should have put my Aussie playlist should definitely have been one of my, my well, lists. That you would go missed that me. opportunity. You're <laughs> stuck with, you're, you're stuck with your uh, shower, shower dance music. Powderfinger <laughs> was, is fantastic. They, I remember when I visited Australia and they were playing and we didn't see them, but it was then. So I've been a big fan for 20 plus years now. So it's been They're fantastic. Love yeah. those guys. It's been that long. Yeah. Dang. Gosh, just, yeah, amazing. Uh, Beck, thank you so much. It's just a pleasure to have you as a guest on Behavioral Grooves, and you've been fantastic. We've really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Kurt. This has been such a treat. I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a real thrill. Thank you. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with Beck Weeks, have a free flowing conversation, and we talk about whatever comes into our peaked brains. Nice. Nicely done. Nice. And you're you're not referring to the pinnacle because we're not at the pinnacle. But no, our- we're definitely <laughs> we are not at the pinnacle. <laughs> but you're talking about stimulating curiosity brains. Our curious brain. So this is yeah. this is an actually interesting piece. I was thinking about this last night as I was going to bed. I'm going, we interview these people who are brilliant and who are yeah. just fantastic. And I'm going, man, we don't, we, we, we are not there. As much as I'd like to think that we are at that level of intelligence, we're, we're not. No. Nope. But I do think, I do oh. think that you and I are probably at the top of the curiosity level. I think that you and I are both at that point, which is, I think, maybe why people talk to us. Because I'm going, why would you talk to us? We are, we are just these <laughs> middling, average folks that you know are curious about this stuff. But maybe it's because of that curiosity. I don't know. Your thoughts? Oh, that's fantastic. I. I love just the idea of being middling. <laughs> that was good. So I, I couldn't agree more. I are we at the top? Beck Weeks is pretty damn high on the on the curiosity scale. I would say so too. I think she is. I think that was great. I I love the fact that they're using this app as a positive way to help us improve who we are. This mm-hmm. idea that it's helping us take these insights from these books and apply them in a more meaningful way based on us. Yeah, it is. It's just about us. And I love the way that th- it came about her story about how they, how they connected and got together was curiosity based. It was because she was just asking <laughs> questions, right? Mm-hmm. You, you know, and that, that's, that's a really cool thing. And she didn't limit her questions. I, I think, she was at Harvard when this started to come about. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but it came about without thinking, Oh, I need to talk to business people or I need to talk to academics. It was just like, whoever's available and whoever seems to have sort of some curiosity about this, I'll talk to them. And that leads her to Sendel and to Mike Norton. And to me that says businesses could really do a great job of taking advantage of bright thinkers in the academic world if, if businesses were more open to it, I think that that academics tend to be open with to working with the corporate world, but there's not exactly resistance, but the default isn't for corporations. The default is not to just go to the academic institution, but they could. And who knows what kind of cool things could could emerge from from that research and for that collaboration, I guess, is what I'm focused on. What do on. you think the friction points are? Why? What, what is impeding corporations from 
even thinking about necessarily going out and finding an academic to come and partner with? Well, the default right now is is corporations want to solve their problems inside. Mm. They, I, I don't think that in general, corporations really want to go outside of the corporate community. And the second is maybe a bit of an us them thing that we're corporations and they're academics and they're different and they're not really thinking of solutions. They're just dreaming up problems. And, you know, I think that there's a little bit of misinformation contributing to that as well. How about you, Kurt? Well, I think the misinformation part is key. I think there's perception out there that academics work slow and you have to go jump through all this red tape because they want to make sure that every little you know, I is dotted and T is crossed. And for many organizations they are going, look, we are working in a world that is changing week over week, month over month. And if we need to do a six month, you know, study on this, it's just not going to work. And I, I I think that that Mm -hmm. isn't necessarily the case, but on both parts, right. That, yeah, things are changing, but there are some underlying components, particularly around human behavior that are not changing. And this idea that researchers move slow, I've seen research, I mean, the whole pandemic really highlighted how quickly researchers can get things going and actually get some really good research out of that in in a very short time. So so that's where I would go with that. I love this fact though, that you kind of keyed up here is that Beck wasn't planning on starting a company. She was, we've talked about accidental behavioral scientists before. She's an accidental entrepreneur. There you go. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. And uh, I think they started with a, like a small pilot with Ideas 42, but it came about in sort of this accidental way, like you said, and that stems back to curiosity. And she was just looking for, for problems to solve or ways to solve problems. You know, she saw these problems in her own life, much like we've, you know, uh, me search, you know, the me search concept, you know, that lots of behavioral scientists have talked about. Psychologists have talked about this for a long time. But I think that she kind of just set out to solve them. And that led her to say, well, who do I need to talk to? Right. Who could help me solve this problem? No, and, and, no, I, I was just going to explain what me search is for people oh, yeah. who might not have heard maybe <laughs> that before. Instead right. of research, it's me search. And this idea that academics and researchers tend to focus in on issues that have a meaning to them. Maybe it's something in their life that they want to understand better or solve for themselves, some issue that they see. And so it's this idea of not necessarily research out there in the general public, but it's like, I'm interested in this thing that's impacting me. So I'm going to research me, basically. Not not that they right. do the research on themselves. So they're not, you know, Carl Jung or Freud or different things like that. But they... Well, well in some ways we kind of, and this might be a bit of a jump, but John Levy, when we talk to him, like his whole thing is influence. This is kind of, a, a, to some degree, a bit of a natural gift. Like John is not, was not a guy growing up who was super well connected. He didn't necessarily seek out being connected. He just wanted to have good relationships, but that, but his personality, his generosity, the the way that he approaches the world kind of led him to that. And that, that experience or those experiences from his uh, salons kind of led him to some degree to say, why is it that we want to get connected and how do we get connected with the right people? I wonder if John would agree with you, because I think he might say that you're saying that this is a natural ability. And I think he might argue that, no, he worked at this, that he uh, he yeah. took the behavioral science research and understood what it was and said, I am going to apply this to my life. I think I think there's a bit of both my personal opinion, which is worth about two cents on the open market. <laughs> But to that degree, I, I would it would be interesting. We'll have to ask him next time we talk with him. So we should. We should. Back, back to back. Back to back. Yes. Uh, so just to uh, kind of wrap up this idea on the accidental entrepreneur, that's a, uh, it's a cool concept. And I'm glad that she did it. I'm glad that there are people in the world who are just willing to take that that turn in the road and say, I'm going to try and start something much like we did with behavioral grooves. Well, and I think it's a good 
inspirational story for many people who are out there who are going, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not that type of person. But the idea that you're curious about something or have a passion around something, I think, shows that if you do, then this is an avenue that you might want to explore. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have an entrepreneurial background or training. I started my company, nobody in my family, the only people that in my family had ever gone out and worked for themselves had failed. I mean, my one brother-in-law, no. had, you know, when they went no. bankrupt and, with his company. So I lived in this this world where you go and you work and you find somebody who will hire you and pay you for something to do. You don't go out and form your own own company. And then I'm, you know, married. Think- Actually, my girlfriend at the time came from a family that was pretty much her entire family was entrepreneur. Ah. You know, her dad is an architect at his own firm and grandfather had all these different businesses and different pieces around that. So if we don't have that background with us, I think sometimes we just default to, well, I can't do that. And I I think Beck's story is one that shows that we can. Yeah, absolutely. You know, lastly, I wanted to cover this idea of statistics matter. This, this whole thing that she said, hey, you know, we know that averages don't mean all the things that are going to have impact, right? So averages are just averages. So there are going to be people on the outside. There are going to be two standard deviations from the mean. And that got me thinking about our conversation with Olivier and, and the book Noise and how we've got managers and leaders need to look beyond the averages. That That's the point. There was a great meme I saw the other day on Twitter or Facebook, one of those, but it was a normal distribution curve, right? And it said in the middle, it had the line going down and averages here. And then there were a few little dots off on the far right underneath the very shallow part of of that. And there was somebody who then made the comment. Then again, the meme was, this is, we need to teach people better and there's idiots out there. It's like, if this is the average, how do you explain this? And it was an arrow pointing at the dots. (laughs) It's like... (laughs) Because it's an average. average. That's <laughs> the idea. It isn't saying that everybody is there. It is the average of all of these dots. And it was just an interesting piece to your point that we are not the averages, that on any distribution curve there is, that you're going to have people b- above and below, and you're going to have many who might be pretty far out there depending upon the the slope of that of that distribution curve or the the shape of it if it's wide or if it's narrow and you're always going to have an outlier or two and so yeah. yeah and the question for leaders is how are they managing to not just their own people but their business how are they managing to the averages but also those who are not within the average that that's my question for business leaders and and so using statistics Beyond just an average, I think is an important thing to be thinking about if you're if you're leading a business or you're leading uh, a team. I think that's a great way to end this. So let's wrap up with a big thank you to Beck and to all of you, our faithful groovers, listeners, however you might identify <laughs> yourself as. And we hope that this week you consider going out and being curious about something. Do some investigation into a part of your life that you think deserves some attention and maybe could use some improvement. And as always, if you do that, let us know. Let us know what you find out. We'd love to hear from you. And put on your behavioral science hat and think about how you might approach this problem if you were a John Levy or a Bob Cialdini or a Beck Weeks. And with that, we hope you go out and find your groove.